Beck Mac here for Pops Art and I am at GOMA and actually Quag Queensland Art Gallery and I'm here with Geraldine Barlow who is a curator here who's been working on this show for quite some time. It's almost been a work in progress even though it's been on the wall because I have been hosting a number of conversations around it um, because it's so intriguing and it's so complex and there's so much contradictions in it. It's called Plenty and it's based on these works here which are 11 works that were part of the original collection that was uh, first gifted to the Queensland Act, well, to the state government. But um, I'm going to start talking to Jerry because she knows much more than me. Jerry, let, let's start with the, the, I guess he's the protagonist, Tor Thomas Lodge Murray Pryor. Who, how is he best known to the public? Yeah, well, I first encountered the name Thomas Lodge Murray Pryor um, on the on the wall labels of um, many of the um, you know great treasures and of our collection, uh, Flemish and Dutch paintings um, such as we see behind us here, um, and his name came up again and again, and so I um, knew him um, as a member of Parliament. Um, uh, he's kind of known as um, an eminent um, pioneer and settler. And I came to learn that it was through his uh, gift, uh, in fact, of 11 paintings to the state of Queensland uh, on condition that they create uh, a public gallery for um, you know, all the members of the community to enjoy their art. So he's kind of really our uh, founding benefactor. When you first told me this story, I was so excited to learn about who is the person that actually kind of, I guess, kicked off uh, the Queensland Art Gallery. I mean, we're, Queensland has been around for 200 years, uh, so this is sort of a really seminal moment in our cultural uh, colonising history in a way. But then the story gets even more complicated and contradictory, and it really speaks to, I guess, Australian's colonial history on so many levels. What's the other side of this story about Lodge, Thomas Lodge Murray Pryor? Yeah. Well, I was really absolutely intrigued to uh, read an article by the art historian Dr. Kerry Heckenberg um, about these works, this founding gift. And um, she um, alerted me to the history of these paintings. So um, these paintings travelled with Murray Pryor over the course of his life here in Australia. Um, he came out as a young man um, with, um, you know, these paintings, but not, not an enormous wealth. Um, and um, he married first one lady and then another. So he, had, he ended up with 20 children. Um, and he lived in some really remote parts of Queensland. And so, um, you know, at one point um, earlier in his life, um, these paintings were all on the walls of the family home. So they were, um, a, it was a slab bark hut, um, very raw walls um, lined with fabric. Um, and the paintings were largely unframed. Um, and uh, people at the time uh, described um, how incredibly unusual it was to come into this raw little hut yeah. and see all these amazing European paintings. Um, but also um, the description of that period uh, captures how frightening a time it was because, um, you know, in between the paintings there were holes in the walls so that um, the occupants could um, defend themselves. Yeah. Um, uh, with rifles um, and um, people were um, obviously uh, taking the land from First Nations um, Australians at that time and so there were also little um, metal pieces that could um, be kind of put down and um, they described them as protecting uh, from spears. So um, a very, a lot of fear um, at this time as well. Yeah. So... Setting the scene, and originally you were going to put these paintings in a, like, I guess the design was of a, a hut, um, and then, it, I mean, they look amazing here now. Kind of, um, because this is quite a small uh, gallery at the back of our larger uh, collection hang, and 
I kind of thought it would be quite fun to have the feeling of stepping into the hut. Um, but I think, um, you know, there might have been the sense that I was uh, turning us into a theme park <laughs> perhaps with this. So, um, you know, these are the kind of interesting conversations we have here um, as a public institution, um, how to um, care for these really important artworks. Um, because, of course, telling the story that was intended by the artists and the culture at the time they were painted is important and that's usually what we do. But I um, thought this story was really quite incredible. And um, the next part of it really is that, um, you know, as Murray Pryor's family were, um, you know, swelling and growing more and more children, um, the neighbouring family, um, the Fraser family, um, were killed um, and uh, it's thought perhaps uh, the young men of the family were involved in killing the local Aboriginal people and that it was um, a um, uh, reprisal for that activity. Um, and um, so this was exactly what many of the uh, European settlers um, feared mm -hmm. at the time. And um, Murray Pryor um, gathered a group of other settlers um, and uh, they um, rode out uh, in revenge against this attack and um, they're thought to have killed um, hundreds of First Nations people, mm -hmm. so particularly the Iman people. Uh, and they were later joined some weeks later by um, First Nations, um, uh, sorry, by um, Native police, which uh, included uh, First Nations people often forced to serve um, under European command. So, uh, you know, this was a period of um, massacre after massacre across Queensland, and it's a history that... Um, we don't always um, uh, speak about or yeah. tell. It was definitely known. It's incredibly uh, documented. Um, the University of Newcastle, uh, their Massacre Sites project um, maps out the, um, the records and history. So, uh, yeah, this, this was a really, um, at the time, it was the largest, um, you know, the Fraser family deaths, which was known as the Hornet Bank Massacre, mm -hmm was the largest single loss of European life. And so to find um, our founding benefactor and these paintings really as a part of this story and um, also um, Murray Pryor's daughter, Rosa Pryor, she was six at the time this occurred, but uh, it's you can really imagine these events leaving uh, a lasting influence upon her life, her yeah. father, so many people. So becoming a novelist, we have um, an incredible um, account and really fascinating quotes from Rosa um, reflecting on her uh, childhood, her My Australian Girlhood was the name of uh, one of her um, uh, novels, uh, but she really paints a picture of, of her life um, at that time and also um, her father subsequently. And, and just to, um, to confirm, um, Murray Pryor was involved in the, the, yeah. the massacres himself. He went out, he rode out with the Frasers and he was part of that. Yeah, so he, um, almost all of the Fraser family were killed. One son was um, away at the time and so he, that one son later is thought to have killed over 200 um, people and um, uh, Murray Pryor um, is thought uh, is said to have um, headed up uh, a kind of vigilante group who were known as the Browns. So he certainly uh, was involved in uh, killing First Nations people, uh, and his um, you know his papers are held as historical documents. And uh, in this exhibition, I really. Um, looked to the words of his daughter, um, taking um, really the, a template from Kerry Heckenberg. And um, what I wanted to do was uh, not so much um, put our energy to um, judging these um, terrible um, uh, events that occurred, uh, but to think about this trauma and the way that it um, echoes through time because I th think it actually relates to then why he gave his treasured paintings mm -hmm. to the people of Queensland and um, in calling the exhibition Plenty, you know, I, I was thinking about 
um, you know, the plenty and bounty of this land that was really, um, you know, taken from one group of people um, by another mm. and um, in a way that that wealth, the way that that wealth is still being held, um, mm. you know, the gallery, we're, we're a treasure box of stories and, um, and artworks, um, heritage, um, the way that we shape and show uh, and tell and explore together these stories. I think um, kind of tells us who we are, yeah. but it also helps us to keep on a path of becoming and questioning yeah. where we want to go to together. Mm. And that's why I think I was so um, involved in these conversations with you because it does really reflect the contradictions of who we are as Australians now. And I think you talked about the holding and transference of power in some of your talks and how um, that that we can be here almost on, you know, there's a relationship for us being here in the gallery with these works mm -hmm. that were present during that frontier war and how we're allowed to, I mean, I guess, enjoy the fruits of uh, that were taken from the First Nations people and how do we reconcile that. So it's we to judge is hard because we are present in the room with all these, you know, it's so complex, isn't it? I guess I'm trying to get to the bottom of that in a way. And I think also there's, um, within that, there were two paintings that were missing, yeah. that, that the mysterious paintings. And in a way, they allude a little bit to, I guess, what the shadow, the really dark shadow side yeah. of this story is. And do you want to talk a bit about yeah, those? Yeah, and there's, it's, um, it's been challenging, hasn't it? Because there are so many parts to this story. But um, so behind us, um, we have uh, two, two artworks, really. And one's, one's more an official artwork, I suppose. It's um, by um, First Nations artist Dee Harding. And this is um, uh, almost like a ready-made artwork, so a contemporary artwork which takes a historical item, and this is um, a rifle which was used by the native police um, and um, was quite possibly used to kill um, these people. Yeah. And they lived um, adjacent to where the Iman people were and many of those Iman people, as they tried to um, uh, flee the kind of um, attacks the revenge attacks, um, they um, came on to Dee's um, traditional country. Mm. So this um, rifle story, in a way, um, exists alongside that of the paintings. They were kind of there, in a way, in the same same place and same time. And um, so the other element that you um, were asking me about was the two missing works. Mm. and. Um, and I've tried to re represent those here with this empty frame. Which I love. I love the black frame. Like, it's it's yeah. kind of gothic in here, I've got to say, as yeah. well. I love that. And, um, and of course, like, um, the missing artwork, it, the missing is um, not just about these artworks. It's about the missing parts of our history. Yeah. Um, you know, Vernon R. Key, who you spoke to um, in one of these conversations, um, he's made this incredible work which we hold in the collection, um, uh, co uh, which tells the story of uh, different people from history who essentially didn't get to tell their story. And I think, you know, we can imagine these people, families um, fleeing and being shot down, um, the drama of their last moments mm. and, and the, the horror and sadness and these stories mm. that we, we didn't get to hear but we know that they're kind of present within the, the land. Mm. And, um, yeah, so the two missing works, I think they both actually, um, you could imagine having a resonance with these events. And the two works, one was a painting of um, Father Time and um, maybe we can even move across. Yeah. I always think that um, the Holy Family here, that the bearded man um, reminds me a little of the bearded figure of Thomas Lodge Murray Pryor, yeah. um, but also um, the figure of Father Time was often uh, presented as the bearded man, bearded man in, um, in art history. So um, the two paintings we don't have, Father Time um, and also Gethsemane or, you know, Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion, uh, these were amongst the 11 that yeah. Murray Pryor gifted uh, to the state of Queensland 
um, and they were in early um, uh, exhibitions uh, of uh, the Murray Pryor gifted works. Uh, and we don't know why we don't have them at the mm. moment. And we, we lock everything up. We inventory it. It's like yeah, the right. biggest mystery ever. Like this is like, a, like an ongoing saga, isn't it? Like yeah. the complexity and the shifts in time that keep hiding things, yeah. bringing them forward, revealing certain truths. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe in the 60s or the 80s, like there are no papers from our, um, our trustees meetings that um, involve the deaccession of these two paintings. So it's quite a mystery, but I was really intrigued by um, Father Time particularly. So uh, because uh, Murray Pryor's daughter, Rosa, she describes um, her father towards the end of his life um, you know, and by that time, he's a very wealthy man. He he was postmaster general, so he was a member of parliament. Founding father. He was like he was like one of the key figures in Brisbane. A founding father, and um, known to be quite grand with his works of art in some ways. And um, he saw them as uh, showing him as a, a cultured man. But I think the way that she describes these reflective moments where he would uh, repeatedly look up to Father Time. And um, she speaks about that there seemed to be um, a kind of sense of um, regret in mm. his demeanour. And she says that um, she is uh, kind of astonished at how much he looks at this work because as a child and growing up, she was always told that um, the um, scroll that Father Time is represented with mm. um, contained words from the Bible. And she says she imagined that it, it said, thou shalt not kill. Mm. And she imagines her father thinking, well, she feels that her father would surely be uneasy given what she knows of his um, life. Yeah. Uh, and so she's amazed at just how much he looks up at this. Mm. And and for me, that, that's that been a real crux of this mm. exhibition, uh, not just what he did, because we know that... Um, massacres were carried out um, and um, often that became to the benefit of people who then um, held land and wealth. Um, but something about that sense of the daughter registering her father's um, regret and anxiety and then the fact that he gives the paintings to the mm -hmm. state and then that that gift uh, kind of unfolds into the birth of this institution and um, almost like redemption. Yeah, I think he was. I think he was seeking to do something that could improve mm. uh, the world. Mm. And um, and and the works are very. You know, they're all about abundance, but often they're biblical themes. They're often Madonna and Child. Um, mm. You know, this work is the Holy Family. So they have this kind of um, moral air in yeah. a way. Yeah. Um, and. I think, um, you know, it was some years ago that I began to think about this exhibition and, you know, I think for so many of us, um, reading the Uru Statement from the Heart, mm. it's such an incredible, um, moving document. Mm. And um, I think the um, emphasis within that upon uh, truth and mm. the need for truth-telling and, you know, I hope this is something that we can all contribute to. Yeah. And when I read Kerry's article, I thought it was an incredible um, uh, formation of truth-telling. And I've tried to um, pick that up in this pair of um, exhibitions. Uh, and, um, and I'm really grateful for the conversations that you've had because yeah. I think this is... Um, Within an institution, we write texts and things. We try to kind of come up with a form of institutional voice, but it's actually the conversations we have together yeah. and not quite knowing at times, finding our thoughts or exploring and coming to to um, ideas together, I think is really important. Yeah. It's like um, threads where the threads of conversation sort of weave together and create this other almost like... Um, spontaneous kind of organic mm. truth or history or, or idea and just as you were saying you know back to this is not mine to bear and the Uluru statement like we really it's it's up to us now to actually tell the story it's not up to the First Nations people to keep reminding us of what's happened it's up to us as you have done to really step up and and dig deep and find find what truth we can 
and then be able to explain that and have those conversations. And I mean, I think that's what's incredible about The Voice, whether it's just when we first started talking about this, mm. no one was talking about anything to do with First Nations people, hardly, that I, you know, it wasn't a public conversation, but now it feels like we c we're actually evolving through this process. But again, the, it's First Nations people who are bearing the pain of that because, you know, it's a battle zone still. It's remarkable. But I guess that's when you hear that this only happened 200 years ago and uh, it's still present. And I guess that's part of what you're exploring. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I think here at the gallery uh, we are very proud to exhibit the work of First Nations mm. artists and... Um, I'm, uh, for me it was incredibly important to be speaking with Dee um, Harding and, um, you know, Dee made this work actually uh, knowing uh, the um, William Fraser, the, the, s the uh, son who was away at the time, actually the, the terrible toll that his um, uh, actions took uh, and so that that had been something as um, you know first as a young man at art school and some of Dee's early works were really um, thinking through that um, but I, th I think this show is a little bit unusual in that it's um, looking at how uh, two different bodies of international of work uh, by uh, international artists relate to um, the um, history in Australia, the colonial history. I've often struggled to find the right language because it's easier to talk about um, settlers yeah. um, and then it's possible to talk about our colonial history. Mm. But even to call uh, someone who you feel you should hold in regard, such mm. as our founding benefactor, a colonist, mm. um, and um, for the, uh, t you know to call ourselves colonists mm. is, isn't such an easy um, place. But I think this exhibition I'm trying to um, yeah, weave together yeah. some of these different um, positions and it's probably good for us to be challenged uh, as yeah. we work with these things. And I think even in our conversations we haven't been able to find the truth because the truth is not black and white like it's a it keeps bending and and there's silver and grey within it but as you're saying there is another part to this which, which is the um, Harriet J Neville Roth works which we're moving towards now and Earlier, you did host a conversation with Vernon R. Key, who he, uh, he's, a, he's really seen how powerful this work is in that it's like a snapshot. It's like, it's like this really, vi you can feel the vitality of this young woman who came to Australia and in this short period of time, she was immersed in this incredible uh, landscape with these First Nations people. And there's sort of, I think you've said there's a real, uh, hum there's a real humility to the work here. And it's um, and then also Alpha Station, which again is Luke Roberts. Um, you know he uh, he's Luke has been, uh, yeah. This is this is where Luke grew up, and uh, so another uh, amazing Brisbane artist. And Luke really, um, you know, was fantastic in drawing that conversation mm -hmm. together with Vernon. And um, this work here, Breakfast at Alpha, is uh, quite a more iconic work by Harriet Jane Neville Rolfe, uh, which. Uh, the Queensland Art Gallery, um, it actually sits within the Australian collection because it tells an Australian story, but mm. Harriet Jane Neville Rolfe uh, was uh, born in Britain. She's um, a member of the um, British nobility, uh, the famous Rolfe family, and uh, she uh, came out uh, to join her brothers and their families uh, uh, you know, in far northwestern uh, Queensland. So both of these stories are anchored, uh, you know, far northwest of um, of Brisbane. And we've toured these beautiful watercolours uh, in the past and Breakfast at Alpha particularly is incredibly popular with its details of the um, little cat and the um, white linen mm. tablecloth mm. and the silver but I kind of thought these two shows actually link together because uh, behind the, um, you know, rather grand table, still within this um, wooden hut, um, we can see on the wall um, a rifle and a pistol um, and there's a kind of, there's a dagger. So these same details actually um, recur and, you know, there's another work that has a whole line of... Um, 
uh, guns on the wall with their kind of shadows up the wall. So, um, yeah, and I think there's there's this little work um, here, um, which uh, I th I kind of find very beautiful. The mm. colours in, and you almost get this sense that it might be um, dusk or twilight. And I've used this as a bit of a motif linking both parts of the exhibition because I think this is very much what um, the homestead where um, Murray Pryor and his family lived would have looked like. Um, but you'll note in the foreground to the left-hand side of this watercolour, um, there's a shape a little bit like a, a well um, with a bucket uh, and there's a man um, holding a raised rifle there. So it's kind of interesting, those details that we don't notice at first. Um, yeah, and then maybe we could travel back to the uh, images of the um, First Nations family here. So I found um, these really, um, these were kind of tucked in the drawers right. and um, I'm not sure that we've ever shown these uh, works mm. and I think, uh, you know, perhaps with a young woman here holding a child on her lap, we can see that that's unfinished. Mm. Um, uh, and I think that um, Harriet Jane Neville Rolfe uh, was a little bit uneasy making these works as mm. compared to uh, representing her own family. But I think she's um, been courageous mm. in her view. She's shown the truth, I think, of what was um, happening at the time. and. To me, there's a real uh, humanity about her representation of this young mother and, you know, there's something quite poignant that she didn't get to finish the child on her lap. Mm. Um, but also the family group next door to that, Castle Vale, um, you know, it's, it's poignant. There's two fires, um, mm. there's a dog and there's a man lying down who looks as if he might be unwell. So it's unclear whether he might be wounded um, there were a lot of um, uh, diseases, um, European diseases, uh, that were also killing First Nations people at the time. So um, I think Harriet Jane's capturing something uh, rarely seen. And um, another part of her story that really interested me was that um, her ancestor, around 200 years um, before... I love this part of the story. <laughs> It's, it's like the cherry on top, the icing on the cake. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I find it pretty fascinating. So John Rolfe um, was a really um, early um, migrant to America and he ended up um, ma marrying the um, uh, young um, Indian woman uh, who we know um, more as um, Pocahontas now. And um, so, you know, she has another a number of other names in um, in her own um, people's um, language, and uh, and th together as a couple, so that that um, marriage is uh, represented in a huge number of paintings. So, including um, I've forgotten the name of the artist, but in the Capitol in Washington, yeah. and uh, at the time that Harriet Jane Neville Rolfe was um, studying to be an artist, um, there were literally hundreds of these paintings of her ancestor being made and um, Hesham Hall, um, the family seat where she was born, um, was visited by John Rolfe and Pocahontas. So um, I, um, I kind of was wondering, you know, is there a special reason, you know, perhaps due to her own family history that Harriet Jane Neville Rolfe uh, was interested to kind of, um, you know, look at First Nations people, um, you know, with with a kind of courage and humanity and to try and make them a part of um, the picture. Um, and otherwise, at the time, you know, she's showing us, um, you know, they're very kind of classic, um, almost like pioneer stories, yeah. like the postman riding through the bush. Yeah. Um, you see her and her family kind of wearing almost like pith helmets and... Um, there's an image of um, with uh, you know a, maybe a young station hand um, bringing them um, a billy of tea. So almost like a documentation, like yeah. like a, a snapshot, and there's sort of like a sense of urgency to them that I can feel like she feels she's only here, and there's so much here. Like she would have 
never seen anything like this, felt that heat, had those flies. And it's like, I have to get this down yeah. because no one's going to believe me back home. Yeah, yeah. And you get that sense of the brightness and the light. And um, there are also like a really beautiful uh, groups of still lives within this um, body of work. So the two exhibitions are, are linked by that. And then sometimes there are motifs like this um, little group of three here. Mm. We discovered that um, this same little girl comes up with her little red dress oh. and white kind of pinafore. And here she is with her dog. Um, but this, this particular work here I find very poignant. It has the title um, Mistake Creek. And it's got the most kind of blacks in the water and uh, this kind of, you know, maybe a waterhole or a deeper section of the, um, the creek. But, you know, I think we know that, um, you know, often massacres occurred uh, near bodies of water and, um, you know, there are many, um, you know, Mistake Creek, Massacre Creek... Uh, place names with um, skulls and bones mm. referred to. So, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, this these paired exhibitions, you know, often do show uh, children and families and something that can look quite sunny, but mm. there's um, definitely this, um, this dark side to the story as mm. well. Mm. And finally, I think um, what you've done so well is, I mean, we can only imagine any of this we can only imagine any of this and you know it's sort of like um you've somehow by bringing together all these little pieces of a puzzle almost it's like being an archaeologist and you've you've you, you, yes yeah and you and you've built this picture of what it, what only a taste of what it could have been like and what we need to understand like we can't go back but you've really brought history into the moment and it's really alive again and I think that's really and it's really melding perfectly with the national conversation around who we are as Australians what are the First Nations stories that we need to hear we need to understand we we do need to feel yeah. and then but then that's how we're going to move forward yeah and um I think uh you know, I think we spoke earlier uh, that, um, you know, within the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, that, um, you know, idea of Makarata and um, coming together after a struggle, um, but that that, you know, happens in relation to, um, to truth. And so, you know, I hope this uh, pair of exhibitions can um, contribute to that um, larger truth-telling um, as much as there's telling, I think we need a lot of um, listening. Yeah. Um, but there's listening to people, there's listening to stories. And I think um, artworks and artists often have their own truth that they hold. Yeah. Um, this, I was thinking it might be nice to just have a little look at this work. So yeah. this is um, the last work that Harriet Jane Neville Rolfe painted before she uh, left Australia. Mm. So I think she touches upon uh, an island in the Torres Strait at one point, but this is a view over the Brisbane River. And um, at this time, uh, she shows the, um, you know, the boats on the river, but also the Houses of Parliament. And so Thomas Lodge Murray Pryor... Would have been looking out the window! <laughs> He was a member of parliament, so oh we've got these two separate stories. Uh, were they there at the same moment? Yeah, the same wow. At the time that this was um, painted, I think it's 1885, yes, um, he was um, serving as a member of parliament. Mm. So I think, like, um, it can seem that all our stories are separate, yes. but then they touch each other mm. in um, different ways. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I know... Um, some of the stories of my um, ancestors um, at this time um, are really fascinating as well. So I think, um, you know, all of us, we can look back uh, and our own um, family members, our, our great-great-grandparents were part of this same story. You know, they too were on the streets. They were riding through the country. They were um, being given a blanket um, or rations. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, well, I think that is such a beautiful place to end on because also I think it's a greatest, you know, it, it's the story of Brisbane itself, which is only a very young city. It really struggles with its cultural identity. It really struggles with what, it, what this town is right now. You know, the Olympics are coming. We're still trying to, like, up ourselves on the ante. But I think 
by, as you said, going back into the past, understanding the threads of history that have been really present here and still are and celebrating those but at the same time honouring the loss of life that's happened with the First Nations people and, you know, moving forward, hopefully, but we have to look at it first and I think that's what you've done so well. So thanks for taking me on this journey. It's been wild. I've been obsessed by it. <laughs> you, uh, interest in the show and, um, and for gathering, uh, you know, not just me but... Um, you know, um, other others together to um, speak about these works. Yeah. And finally, I've got to say, you know, I think this is one of the most well thought out, considered, intelligent shows I've seen in a long time. And I'm just, just saying that, but it's it is so complex, and you could spend hours here going over and over the different details. So amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Beck. Thank you so much. <laughs>